Welcome to this update training session on EdgeCam 2014 R1. In this overview, we'll take a look at many of the new technologies added in this release of EdgeCam. We'll demonstrate some of that functionality. Please note that this is not a comprehensive list of everything that is new and different in this version of EdgeCam. We've simply highlighted the things that we think will be of interest to the majority of our customers at M2 Technologies. Be sure to refer to the What's New documentation that's installed along with EdgeCam 2014 R1 and read through that to gain a, a sense for some of the things that we may have not have uh, mentioned, highlighted, or gone into great detail here. And certainly if you run across things where you have uh, questions on that, we'd uh, love you to contact us and we can provide answers for you on those. In this section we'll look at the information you have available via the internet, licensing changes, and the current supported CAD systems. The latest release of EdgeCam can be downloaded from the Vero customer portal and it's going to require an update expiry of September 2013 or later on your license. I want to remind you that there's a great deal of information now available to you in the customer community forums. In here you'll find forums on a variety of EdgeCam topics including EdgeCam 2014 R1 with information provided by M2 Technologies, by Vero, other resellers, and other customers as well. This is designed to be a peer-to-peer -peer user forum and we hope that uh, you do participate in it. The more customers that participate, the better the forum is and the more useful the information is for other people. For our customers that have the network license, there's been an upgrade to the Sentinel RMS that will now be using EdgeCam version 8.5.3. One of the benefits of this upgrade is it's going to allow license revocation to be done directly over the internet. We'll cover that in a, in a little bit more detail, but this is definitely something that is part of your plans to upgrade to the new version of EdgeCam. If you're using a network license, you're going to want to include some time to maintain an upgrade that network license component as well. We often don't have to do that at EdgeCam versions, but that's definitely worth doing here. Another minor change is that CLS is now going to go to a unified CLS for both the R1 and R2 versions. So beginning with EdgeCam 2014 R1, when you install EdgeCam, you'll simply have a CLS called CLS 2014. That CLS is going to serve both the current 2014 R1, but when you install 2014 R2, the CLS will also serve that. At that time, when you install the R2, when it's available, the CLS will be upgraded and it will still continue to serve the R1 license. So this minimizes the numbers of CLSs that are installed and running. Another addition is the Shop Floor Solids Module license. This is designed to be paired with the Shop Floor Editor License. The Shop Floor Editor License provides ability to let the machinists take an EdgeCam part that's been put together and have a limited amount of access to make modifications to a program and repost it. They're able to do things like change feed rate, spindle speed, cut increment, and other you know, on-the-fly changes that may need to be done on the shop floor and the shop floor editor module did not include ability to work with CATIA V5 or uh, Creo Parametric or, or Pro E parts. So this new module now provides license access to those solids. So digging in a little bit into the license update. If your company has the EdgeCam Sentinel RMS network license, you'll want to allow some time to do the license upgrade to the latest version. This could be done before rolling out EdgeCam to the workstations, or it could be done after. The key point here is that this is how the process works. You're going to first check in all the EdgeCam licenses and then remove the Sentinel RMS um, program through the Add Remove programs that's installed on the license server. Then, using the EdgeCam 2014 R1 DVD image, you'll install the Sentinel RMS License Manager that puts the latest one on. 
And then this is an optional step and is something we haven't done before, typically on network licenses. But you can also install the CLS on the license server. This is going to enable you to revoke licenses automatically, which we'll take a look at next. In previous versions of EdgeCam, if you had to move the EdgeCam license from one server to another, there was a fairly involved process that could take sometimes several days to do of getting a new server up and running with temporary licenses, then revoking licenses from the old server, submitting a rev what we call revocation tickets as proof of the license being removed, um, have them verified, and then send a permanent license back. The Sentinel RMS License Manager update is coupled with installing CLS on the server, as long as the server has an internet connection, is going to allow the license to be revoked over the internet. Exactly the same process as has been done on our standalone Sentinel RMS keyless license servers for some time. The benefit to the network administrator is that all the licenses will be able to be revoked automatically. It's a much quicker process and is literally going to take minutes to do to move things over to a new license server. And there's complete control by the customer without any need to send revocation tickets for verification. M2 Technologies has put together a um, tech support video on what the process involves. We've done this on our own servers, we've recorded the process, and we're gonna make that available to our network license administrators on request. So if this is something you'd like to do, just give us a shout on the tech support desk and we'll point you over to the video so that you can see how the process works and you'll be able to go through and do this minor maintenance task as part of your roll up to EdgeCam 2014 R1. Another improvement to the network license for our EdgeCam users is what happens if the connection to the server is lost. In previous versions, the EdgeCam users that were working on a part would lose access to save the file that they're working on when the network license access was lost. At this version of EdgeCam, we're now changing that. So you're gonna have an opportunity to save the work on your part after that point, EdgeCam will close, and when you restart it, Grace Licensing will allow you to, to continue to do your EdgeCam work without a connection to the licensed server until that licensed server is active again. There's nothing special that you need to do to trigger this. This is part of the behavior of the license manager, and this will be a great benefit to our customers that have network licenses because you know at some point you're going to lose the connection to the licensed server and it will be a very minor interruption now rather than losing the work that you've done. Here's a list of the current CAD platforms that we're supporting both with direct solids loading and also with data translators. The new changes here are that we're now supporting up through SOLIDWORKS 2014 and Unigraphics NX up through 8.5. Just a quick reminder that in terms of DWGs, uh, recently at I think EdgeCam 2013 R2, DWG translators were improved to support both paper space, but also the Autodesk Inventor DWG as well as the AutoCAD DWG flavors. So a lot of work done recently on data translators and you know continuing to maintain our solids loaders. In this next section, we're going to look at the improvements to EdgeCam workflow, to milling, and to turning. Again, keep in mind this is not a comprehensive list, but simply a summary of the things that we think will be most valuable to our EdgeCam users. And then at the end of that, we'll have a demonstration of some of those items. The EdgeCam launcher was introduced at, at version 2013 R2 and has some slight improvements at 2014 R1 based on customer feedback to improve usability. It automatically resizes for lower than optimal resolutions. So if you're using EdgeCam on um, a 720p type device, a touchscreen, a tablet, um, other things like that, the launcher will now resize to be able to be fully used in there. We can now pin URLs and folders into the tools area. 
the recently used file list, you can right click over any file in there and copy the file path to maybe go directly to that folder in Internet Explorer or uh, something like that. And you can also uh, scroll through the file list and the new live job reports that we'll explain uh, have been added into the launcher as well. In this section on workflow, I want to mention that we're simply going to highlight the changes to workflow. Users that are already using workflow and comfortable with it will find these changes are common sense. They're very easy to absorb. They make workflow even easier to use. For the EdgeCam user not comfortable with workflow, we're going to offer a separate web training that goes in depth into how to use workflow and how the commands are similar to EdgeCam. Just as a quick overview, you'll see from the interface that workflow is a very clean interface. It's much simpler than EdgeCam and it drastically simplifies the process of getting the part set up. We load the part, we assemble stock, and a fixture, and a machine tool on the setup ribbon. The component setup page allows us to quickly adjust where the zeros are and how the assembly relates to itself. Workflow does include all the commands we're used to from traditional EdgeCam. They're all at our fingertips on the ribbon toolbar. As we move into features, Workflow identifies the features that you have in the EdgeCam part, allows us to create our own manual features if we need to, and then the machining tab allows us to create the tool path we need a very quickly, very easily using planning board. And then when we're at the final stage of the process, we're ready to generate code and move into workflow. The, the screen layout's handled through um, very easy to navigate icons, and it's a much easier interface than EdgeCam. So in terms of workflow, the managers that drive workflow have been improved. In the machine manager, we can now load all the post processors installed on the active workstation. In the fixture manager, we're able to now identify whether a fixture with graphics is an inch or millimeter fixture so that it can be correctly scaled if it's used in the other environment. A major addition to workflow is that chucks are now supported. And this is supported for both lathe and also for three axis mill applications. So chucks can be chucks with jaws or collet systems. And for lathe chucks, real neat, they're now interactive with Code Wizard. So you can uh, drive your settings of your post processor and assembling the chucks um, right through the fixture manager. In terms of vices, there's a maximum grip distance that's now been added. Vices have a maximum size they can accept, and this helps filter out invalid vices so that if a vice can't open large enough to accept the stock shape, that vice is not listed as a valid vice. And there is a dynamic preview of those custom graphics. Stock Manager similarly has filters for both units and materials now and also a dynamic preview of the stock shapes. In terms of workflow improvements, there is an auto alignment when you bring in a part that has a C-axis feature into the lathe environment. This will detect the flat or hole or something similar and clock that up to C-axis zero for you to speeds the process. There's been improvements to automatic fixture placement. There's been improvements to component setup so that it's now possible to move the part, the stock, and the fixture. So when we go to the component setup tab, there's individual check marks for part, stock, and fixture, and you can select all of them, or multiples, or only one of them, and control which item is being moved. It's also now possible to move that assembly at any time that you wish to. So it just speeds up in the component setup and makes it easier to manage. There's also a significant improvement where we can now directly machine individual features. So on the machining ribbon toolbar, there's a new command that lets you directly target a feature and build toolpath just for that feature, rather than going through planning board. And another major improvement is that the ribbon toolbar is now editable. So you can change the ribbon toolbar, you can arrange things in the order you want, and you can even add in your own macros, masks, strategies, and other things like that. The workflow strategies that drive the tool path creation have also been improved. Tool selection is now done based on the switch in the tool store that identifies whether a tool is a roughing tool or finishing tool. 
Now we want to remind you that, that the roughing finishing tool designation is not only at the tool level, but it can also be modified on a job kit basis. So the screen image in the left shows the tool path that would have been built by strategies in workflow at 2013 R2 were the same tools used for roughing and then for profiling because it was it, it met the requirements of depth of cut and tool diameter size for the features and it was the only tool in the kit or maybe the best tool in the kit to do that. The problem though is that many users want to have one tool for roughing and a different tool for finishing. And so now the strategies are aware of whether the roughing tool or finishing tool has been checked and will select a suitable tool from the job kit for roughing and as well as for finishing. Another improvement is at the review toolkit stage and the auto renumbering. At 2013 R2 version the auto renumbering would renumber all the tools in the job kit. It's been improved to now renumber tools that do not have a tool number assigned. The, the difficulty or challenge with the previous scheme is that tools that were selected from the job kit usually have a tool number for a reason and we don't want to renumber those tools. They represent standard tools in the machine magazine. So now the tools that were picked from tool store that were not in the job kit, which the strategy numbers T99 or T1000, th those tools will be the ones that are be renumbered and duplicates are also avoided as part of this improvement to tool renumbering. There's been a new chamfering cycle that's introduced both for traditional edge cam as well as for workflow. The new milling cycle for chamfering supports both taper mills and spot drills. It supports solids and wireframe. It permits chamfers to be modeled into the part, as well as what we call deburring, where chamfers are not modeled and we need to break the edge. We support what we call direct picking, which was introduced in many of the cycles at previous versions of EdgeCam, where we can directly pick edges on the part. And this is really beneficial because we can not only machine two-dimensional, chamfers such as the one shown in the image in the dialog box, but we can also support three-dimensional chamfering where we have curved edges along a part and want to run a tool through there to deburr that. We'll be demonstrating how this cycle works uh, in all of these different applications. This is one of the newer cycles that does have the pictures in the dialog. So here's the big benefit to this cycle. We've been able to do chamfering for some time using the profile mill cycle. But the profiling cycle as a mill-based cycle can only be used with taper mills. So when we get into applications where customers have a dual-use tool that's used for spot drilling as well as for chamfering, they really had to create um, another tool as a taper mill simply to use it with profiling. This new cycle is able to select tools from the taper mill or the spot drill class, and it's able to allow us to control depth either by the contact point or the depth that we want the tip of the tool to run past the shape, and certainly the ability to machine 3D chamfers as well as 2D is a big improvement over the way that the profiling cycle had been used to pull off chamfering in the past. So this is a really helpful new cycle, big expansion in the mill side of the software. EdgeCam now supports 3D cutter compensation in the surface or 3D based milling cycles. So on the control tab of many of these cycles you'll now see a new option called 3D normal offset output. What this does is it takes advantage of machine tools that offer 3D cutter compensation. So in the uh, TNC world that's a CC3 code. In the ISO world, um, G41 is typically used, or G142 if we're conventional cutting, and Siemens uses the cut 3DC command. What these do is they allow the machine control to adjust the part shape to the uh, based on the vector that the tool is to the workpiece. And it's part of the ultimate milling license. There is some uh, new code constructors available in Code Wizard, so you would need to update your Code Wizard post to be able to turn on the function and turn it off. And it's simply activated on surface mill cycles by the check mark in the control page. So for those of you that do 3D milling and have a machine control that can support um, 3D cutter compensation, this is definitely something you'll want to take advantage of. Another big improvement in milling is the ability to now support what we call dynamic offsets. So as the graphic image in the right shows, if you have a part where 
it set, let's say, a five-axis Tronian type machine. You set zero up in the corner of the workpiece, perhaps up in this area. The challenge that we have is that when the Tronian rotates, the coordinate system that was up here has now moved essentially to a different spot in space. For machine controls that do not have dynamic offsetting, our suggestion would be that you want to place the zero point at the pivot line of the machine. And we have a process for doing that that we've used for Haas's and other type machines for a very long time. It's very well documented. If you're not aware of how to do that, contact us on the support desk and we can run through how to pull that off. What this allows is on machine controls such as Mazak, for example, you have a G54.2 function that is able to track that when the rotary axis moves, the zero point has gone from here and shifted over to here. So it's able to track that through space. It's basically an absolute type datum, but the machine tool is tracking where zero has gone. This now allows us to output that, and the commands added into the index, the datum shift, and the merge sequences commands as a new datum type. So datum type can now be incremental, absolute, and dynamic. This does require some update to your code wizard, and it's a new machine option. So up on the main machine tab, you can enable dynamic offsetting with a simple checkbox, and then some minor work in your code constructors, and you'll be able to take advantage of this significant enhancement in the multiplane milling. Another milling improvement that will benefit all of our customers is fixture avoidance. The improvements to fixture avoidance span several different software commands. First of all, in the update fixtures command, there's ability to now input offset values. Once you've run update fixtures, standard behavior is that both EdgeCam and Simulator are now aware of the fixtures that are active at that point of the program. So as the graphic image in the upper right shows, we could have straps or clamps that interfere with the machining area and we need to make sure that tools don't run through those. In the past, we would have had clearance that the user would put into roughing or hole drilling to make sure that the tool lifts high enough. You don't have to do that anymore. In the roughing cycle, the fixtures are automatically avoided. The clearance is now in designed to be relative to the current stock and to the fixtures. So if I say that I want my clearance an inch above, the roughing is now interpreting that to be an inch above the highest point of the stock and the fixtures so that roughing does not violate those zones. In the whole cycle, there's a new pick in the clearance area to make that relative to current stock. And again, that's relative to the combination of the current stock and the active fixtures as designated through update fixtures. We'll be demonstrating how this works. It really reduces the risk of the user accidentally putting in moves that violate your fixturing. Obviously, Simulator does a great job of picking that up, but this just speeds up the process of building tool path that'll work first time right out of the gate. So the profiling cycle handles fixture avoidance slightly differently. It's still keyed on the update fixtures command, but in this case, we're using the protect solid checkbox to trim away tool path that runs through fixture areas. At EdgeCam 2013 R2, on the check surfaces button off the control tab, the protect solid switch was added that allows us to machine a feature and gouge protect the surrounding solid and trim away tool path that violates that. Well, the tool path trimming now includes and is aware of fixtures as well. On the turning side, there's been a couple of additions that help with ease of use quite a bit. One of them is that there's now pictures on dialogues for the rough turn and the finished turning cycles. So as you move through the individual settings of those two cycles, the graphic image will change and update. Those of you who have already migrated into 2013 R2 notice that there's some changes to the interface, and part of those were that cycle dialog box now have graphics on them. It will take some time to update all of the cycles in the software. At some point, all of the cycles will have the graphic images at this release, the rough turn and finish turning have added those graphics in. On the grooving, there's now retraction options for high feed. So if I'm working in an area where I have an angled groove, we need to make sure to withdraw the tool at the same vector angle that the feed rate happens at. If we command G0, there's a, a risk of breaking a tool moving through a vector that's not intended for machines that do dog legs. So the retract at high feed option's been added into the link type for both the rough grooving and the new finish grooving cycle. So we want to remind any customers that may not be aware, 
that at Edgecam 2013 R2 there's been a new finished groove cycle added has a great range of benefits to it including built-in cutter comp control lead in and lead out ability to influence the amount of overlap we have at the seam point uh, to be able to control where the seam point lies and even to change the gauge point to the other side of the tool and also at 2013 R1 there was a new rough profile cycle added that builds tool paths uh, basically roughing cuts parallel to the finished part shape it does have integral cutter comp control lead in and lead out it is stock aware and it has swarf clearance options so for those customers who may not be aware of those technology changes we definitely want to remind you of them as well as that at Edgecam 2013 R2, the turning product's been expanded to support three and four turret machine tools uh, as part of the advanced lathe license. That updates to both the Code Wizard technology, to Simulator, and to the Sequence browser. So if your company has those machines already or is considering purchasing and investing in those, Edgecam can handle them. In terms of solids, one of the really useful things in here is that the single solid component improvement is going to reduce your file size. So if I have a part such as the one shown here where we have multiple solids on a tombstone, it's the same solid repli replicated several times around the part. And in previous versions of EdgeCam, this could result in a very large file size. What happens now at EdgeCam 2014 R1 is that EdgeCam recognizes that it's the same solid repeated multiple times and the, it will reduce the file size. It only stores one of those solids. The others are basically references. They're still going to be listed in the feature window. You can still create features on them. You're not losing any capability, but the file size is going to be much smaller. This happens automatically. There's nothing extra that you have to do and files that are opened from a previous version when they're saved, if they're a candidate for moving to a single solid component, the resulting file will be a smaller file size as well. Just a reminder that on the solid CAD loaders that we're now supporting the latest version of SolidWorks as well as up to NX 8.5. There's been a new option added to be able to heal step models that are loaded in and you can get to that from the options menu preferences command on the solids tab and another little kind of secret is that you can create CPLs now in manufacture mode we'll cover that in the demonstration that follows so one of the big maintenance tasks at this version of EdgeCam is a new graphics engine as part of this update you're going to need to update your video card drivers so if you haven't done that recently head up to your video card manufacturers website and download the latest driver that they have the benefits are that you're going to have improved rendering and shading the parts are a lot easier to see rapid moves points the coordinate systems are, are much easier to visualize now and the performance of uh, rotating and moving around large files has been improved as well there's an updated uh, CPL marker now where the axes are labeled and we show the rotation directions around the respective axes. And in the machining cycles, there's now a reset all picks button up in the upper right corner of the cycle dialog. So if you've ever been in a situation where you've copied a cycle in the sequence window and then you need to edit the cycle and target some different sets of geometry, we need to clear out the old picks and put in new ones and the reset all picks just clears every single pick out quickly with one click of a button so that we can retarget new sets of geometry. This is a big time saver and very useful new addition. All right, let's go do a machining demonstration and look at some of how some of these changes can help you be more efficient with milling and also on the turning side as well. When EdgeCam is installed, you'll have a shortcut on the desktop for the launcher. This provides a central access to all of the software programs installed with EdgeCam. You can get to the same things from Start and All Programs and the EdgeCam group, but this provides very quick access to EdgeCam, recently opened files, as well as the peripheral EdgeCam software applications. You'll notice that starting at the top of Launcher, there's a question mark, and this provides access to a variety of help information for you. And looking further at 
the odd launcher, you'll notice that the next thing down is that you have arrows that can be used to scroll back and forth through different software packages that are part of the peripheral edge cam setup, including Code Wizard post processor files, the editor. You'll notice that under each software application, if it's been launched, there are recently list a uh, recently open file list that you can pin items to keep them in the list. Otherwise, the list shows the most recent to the oldest. As we scroll back over to the edge cam side, you'll notice that we can launch a new edge cam session for milling, turning, or YRDM. And this will open traditional edge cam already configured for the environment you've requested. Over to the side, we have a list of recently opened files. And you notice again that we can pin files that we perhaps want to continue to work on for some time in the list. And then below that is the areas to launch workflow, as well as settings for workflow and the different managers that are used as part of the workflow software. Over in this middle area is an area called tools. And primarily, the default workflow or the default a uh, launcher includes launchers for the different tool store applications, but you can also add your own items. So notice that I've added a shortcut to the CAD software package I often use, and even a shortcut to Code Wizard and a, a file folder. Let's look at how you do that. So first, when I click this file folder, let's say that I wanted to take the mill folder and add that here. All I have to do is take that shortcut and drag it and drop it onto the list. You can do the same whether that's a shortcut to a piece of software or a website link or a folder. And if at some point down the road you want to change your mind and remove it, notice that if I right click over this, I can choose to delete that custom tool. So quick launch access to, to different pieces of software right through the tools panel. Well, let's go and look at some of the turn enhancements at EdgeCam 2014 R1. So from working from the recently used file list, I'm going to launch a file that contains some of those, and we'll take a look at them. The graphic view in traditional EdgeCam looks a little bit different and certainly fresher at EdgeCam 2014 R1 compared to previous versions. You'll notice that the part rendering, shading, and light display is done differently than in previous versions. This makes the part much easier to see, particularly if there's multiple solids available. Additionally, ancillary things like rapid moves, the set safe start position, coordinate input locations, and points are all easier to see. They, they're a, a little bit bolder or, or thicker uh, style, and it makes it much easier to see where those things are located. Additionally, the coordinate system indicator has been updated, so we can see that the axes are now labeled, making it easier for the casual user to see which axis is which. This is a turn environment, and so the y-axis is not displayed here, but you'll see as we head into milling that the indicator also includes the y-axis for milling, as well as rotational um, aids to help just, again, better see what's happening in the screen area. Let's head over to manufacture mode and take a look at some of the turn enhancements at this release. One of the things that you'll notice is that the graphic images added to cycles such as rough turning and finishing have now been turned on. So we can see that as we click through the different input fields, the graphic image updates to help see what's in here. And the help system, the little help button over the top of the tab shows uh, a brief description about what that graphic image is trying to do. This is great for helping both new users and existing users navigate through the input fields. The cycles are very flexible, and there's many cases where some of the options that may be inside a cycle may not be something a user uses all the time. And being able to go in and select a graphic image and see what that graphic image does, and a quick help system reminder about it, it helps make the software much easier to use. Remember, this hasn't done away with the Help button. You still have the Help button in the corner. And it launches the Help directly to that topic, including what's new list. It will list anything new with that version. It will also explain um, along the different pages all of the input options that go into there, many including graphic images to help further understand what the cycle's doing. 
Another function that's been added is that the coolant has been streamlined to match the milling work that was done at 2013 R2. So now your coolant choices, once your post is updated, are all consolidated on your tool for just making things easier to select as part of the tool setup. One of the changes that's definitely worth noting here is in the rapid uh, feed rate or rapid retraction in the grooving cycles. If I zoom in here, you'll notice that in this grooving cycle, the dotted moves for rapids draw back at a different vector than the cutting that's needed for this angled groove on this angled face. This is not a mistaken edge cam. It's simply the reality of what will happen if we command a G0 move in a machine that executes rapids at dog leg. Rather than doing this, what we would want to do to avoid a, a tool breakage and a part collision, in previous versions we would have selected this to be a feed type retraction. And so now the, the drawback is done at the same feed rate as the actual cut. However, this can result in a long cycle time. So if I verify the cycle time out of that command, right now it's 3 minutes and 41 seconds. Well, let's see what happens if we change to the new high feed option. Now what high feed is, is essentially a rapid retraction, but it's done under G0, I'm sorry, under G1 control rather than G0. So if I change my output units to inches and my maximum feed rate to 50 inches a minute, by the way, that's a default value from your Code Wizard post processor. What will happen now is that the rapid retraction is done at a high feed rate, so it's done under G1 control, but it's much faster than feeding back at the cutting feed rate. It's chopped nearly two minutes of cycle time off of this part. That option is both in the rough groove cycle and also in the new finish groove cycle as well. So if I head to the new finish groove, you'll notice that on the lead links page there, again, the same thing. It's got high feed for a link type. Let's generate code and take a look at both the CNC code and the new editor. So notice that the editor now has an updated ribbon toolbar. The functionality that we're used to is still here. It's just a little bit fresher and easier to see. So if I want to click the Find button, I can go and find Tool 3. And notice that as we go down to here, we can see the result in the CNC code of the retraction back at a high feed rate and then switching into cutting moves for the, for the recut at the next groove area. One of the things, by the way, that I do like about the new editor is that when you open the code file, it's immediately maximized. I don't have to first maximize it to be able to see more of it. So, you know, nice, nice options with the editor, nice fresh look to it. Let's jump back to the launcher and let's take a quick look at the new live job reports. So in launcher, you've got in the tools area a new link for live job reports. These are automatically installed as part of EdgeCam. The live job reports function much the same way as the previous job reports did, but like the name live indicates, they're much faster and it's a fresh screen layout and includes some neat functions like ability to export job reports to PDF, to Word, Excel, or to graphic images. But the searching is very, very fast. So if I go in here and search for something like mill, and OK, immediately, regardless of whether I have a huge database with hundreds or possibly thousands of jobs, or a smaller database, every single one is listed for me. And I can click on any job in there, and it, again, immediately, quickly takes me out to that job, where we have access to all the functionality we had before. But even the different pages here, so we can go into pages for tool lists and other things. The pages are all at our fingertips. It's the new job report system is, again, installed as part of EdgeCam. You don't have to do anything extra to add it into the installation. And the new EdgeCam uh, 2014 R1 DVD does include a separate install option if you wish to host the job reports from a separate workstation. We'll cover more about the live job reports in a future web training session. Let's go have a look now at some of the milling enhancements. 
The part we have on the screen here has had some toolpath that was built in EdgeCam 2013 R2, previous version of EdgeCam, and we'll take a look at some changes to toolpath and some new capability on the milling side here at 2014 R1. First, notice that the rendering is um, improved and different, and the axis indicator as well. Since this is a mill part, we can see the y-axis added in and the indicator for that. And you'll notice also the rotational directions that show blue for z, red for x, green for y. What a rotation around those axes would move in. Another thing that can be helpful is if we go to the view caption properties and turn on axes, it can be helpful to just increase the length of the indicator axes for the red x, green y, blue z off the part origin. In this case it's a locating pin and notice how these are a thicker display and a little bit easier to visualize on the screen compared to again previous versions. So as we head to manufacture mode here I'm going to turn off the display of the machine and I want to kind of rotate the view around so we're looking in from the y-axis positive direction and the roughing cycle notice that the, the height that this travels through is at risk of running through the clamp. Now the move itself doesn't run through the clamp, but the move represents tool center line, and it's very possible that the tool could run through the clamp. The only reason it has not actually gone through the clamp is simply where the, the start point of the pockets are. It's not anything intelligent or some extra precaution that the user took. Obviously if there's a collision simulator will report on it, it does a great job of predicting that, and the user will be able to change the clearance point to a different position. But we want to look at how EdgeCam 2014 R1 removes the risk of that possibility from even happening. You'll notice that the Update Fixtures command now has options to put in offsets off our fixture. So if I say I want a fixture offset here of maybe a hundred thousandths of an inch, and press OK, when the toolpath is rebuilt, the roughing is going to adjust the tool rapid plane to make sure there's no risk of collision with the fixturing that is active in the current part. There's nothing special that I have to turn on in roughing to make that happen. It's an automatic behavior that's knowledgeable of the current fixtures that are active in the part and moves to avoid them. Very, very cool. Now I'm going to go hide that toolpath out of the way. We'll turn its visibility off and we'll look at how hull cycles work. In this case, the hull cycle is obviously moving straight through the clamp. Again, simulator would do a great job of predicting that. But let's look at how EdgeCam 2014 R1 can help eliminate that possibility completely. Over on the depth page, there's a new option for clearance and it can be associated to the current stock. When we select this, it's not only the current stock, but it's also the fixturing as well. So we're saying that we want the clearance plane to be a quarter inch above the stock and fixturing combination. Let's make that change in all of the cycles. Notice that the result now is that the whole cycles all lift to a plane where they're clear of our active fixturing. Again, registered by the update stock and update fixture commands at the top of the sequence. That automatic behavior will speed things up greatly. The profiling cycle also has similar gouge protection to it. That's handled through the protect solid option over on the control page under check surfaces. So that would also be aware of not only the solid but active fixturing in the part as well. Okay, let's go have a look at the new chamfer mill cycle. Now this is a new cycle that is introduced at EdgeCam 2014 R1, so you'll want to make sure to add that into your menu structure. When you go to the mill cycles category list in the customized box, you'll find chamfering and you'll be able to take that and both add it into your existing menus and also any existing icons or toolbars so that you can use this command. So if I go and choose this 
As we work through the dialog box, you'll see that this is one of the newer dialog boxes where the graphic images update as we click through the box. Now in this case, I'm going to be working with the hull feature, which includes a chamfer at the top of it. So we'll be using the chamfer setting, and we're going to set the contact point to begin with at 50% of the tool, and simply use the chamfer information from the feature. Configure the depth page for basic inputs, and everything else looks good. Now I see a warning here that you must use a taper tool or a spot drill. The chamfer cycle is improved over previous ways that we've attacked part chamfering with ability to use a tool such as a spot drill. So let's, just for the time being, we'll copy the spot drill that I have down to the bottom of the list, and then we'll start the chamfering cycle. Now it asks for the edges to work with, and I'm going to pick the through hole feature. No containment boundary. And when we look at the resulting tool path and simulate that, you see the motion. And if I tilt the display here a bit, you can see how the tool is running right along the finished chamfer edge. The tool tip is down below the work surface at 50%. Well, what happens if I change the depth, the contact point to 20%? Notice how the tool path is modified, so the center line drags closer to the part, the tip doesn't go quite as deep, and we're good. We'll leave it at the standard 50% that we had selected. Now what I want to do is now apply chamfering to this feature over here, where there's not an edge break put in yet. So I'm going to copy the chamfer cycle. I'm going to open the copy, and since this feature did not have a chamfer in it, I'm going to tell it that we're using deburring, and then I'm going to uncheck Use Feature Info, and I'll say that I want a chamfer depth of 20 thousandths. Other than that, the cycle inputs are pretty much the same. Now I do want to point out that since we made a copy of the previous cycle, the inputs for the solid are already checked. Now I could go in here and clear out the checks by going to here, clicking the X, but Quite frankly, if you have cycles that have multiple inputs to them, perhaps a solid, and then boundaries, and then start points and other things, there's a lot of inputs that need, might need to be redone. EdgeCam 2014 introduces this new icon in the corner of the dialog to reset all the picks, and this clears it out so I can have a fresh start. Very useful when copying tool path. So now we're going to go target this feature, and there are no boundaries. And notice that the resulting tool path, when we simulate it, now it takes the tool and it machines through there. And if I pause this and drag it back a little bit, we can see that the tool is in fact breaking into the part edge by the requested amount. Now let's look at another application of deburring. In both of these cases here, the hole and this pocket are prismatic features, meaning that they're a constant z-axis. But if I look in from a front view, you'll notice that this face here has curvature to it. So this is a three-dimensional edge. And to run this chamfer mill along that edge and put in an edge break is going to require some different capability here. So let's go in here and look at how to do that. In this case here, I'm simply going to use Reset All Picks. And I'm going to take advantage of EdgeCam's new direct picking. We don't have a feature here, but if I turn off the 2D chain so I can chain tangents within a 3D model, and just double click on the model edge, we can directly pick all of the tangent edges. Direct picking was added several versions back. And when we finish and go through all the inputs, we now have a part chamfer that's set up that runs the tool around that edge to deburr it, cutting in 20 thousandths, and looking in from a front view, you'll be able to see that tool path as it rises and falls along that three-dimensional edge. So to summarize part chamfering, it can work with features, it can work with the raw solid, it can work with chamfering where the chamfer is modeled, it can work with edge deburring where the chamfer is not modeled, it can support two-dimensional as well as three-dimensional chamfering, and obviously also work with wireframe.
Additionally, the new chamfer mill cycle allows us to use spot drills as well as taper mills. So it's a very flexible cycle. We're sure you'll want to dig into this and begin to use it as soon as you can. There's another new technology we want to quickly demonstrate called masks. So I'm going to go to this um, 2D pocket here and I'm going to begin with just throwing in some basic tool path using the profiling strategy that installs with EdgeCam. The result of this tool path accelerator is that it quickly moved the previous tool to tool change, picked a suitable cutter from tool store, and pro runs a profiling cycle around the part. As we open the profiling cycle, we can see the standard layout that the profiling cycle ships with. That's called a mask, and I've added in my own mask for feature profiling, where what we've done is we've reduced and eliminated the things that we don't want. Notice that the mask for feature profiling has cut away and eliminated some of the ancillary stuff, including the entire control tab that normally comes up on the standard profiling cycle. This addresses a long-standing user request to be able to not only customize the EdgeCam cycle dialogs, but specify which inputs have to go directly into them. So the concept of masks we'll quickly show here, but we'll provide some update turning specific to masks that explores them in a bit of detail in the future. To begin with, when I go in here and I go to customize dialog, this allows me to begin to work on masks. So I can go in here and I can see all of the different inputs that make up the profiling cycle. So if I want to go down, for example, to offset, notice that offset's set to be visible. If we don't want to show that, what we can do here is I can say don't show that modifier and when I apply that notice how the offset has been removed there may be other modifiers that you don't want to display but you do want to assign to assign a default value perhaps cutter compensation is one that you always use but you don't want to have to you have the user continually be prompted for what to display I can say don't show the modifier and lock it into centerline and if I apply that, then I don't see the, the comp, but it is locked to centerline. Now I can also go in there and say show the modifier, but again, lock it to centerline. And so every time that we start a profiling cycle with whatever new mask we're creating, what would happen is this would lock that value into centerline, regardless of the settings that may have been used in some previous cycle. So masks are a really useful functionality. They're very easy to put together, and when you create your own masks, you're able to quickly go into any machining dialog that you've created masks for, and the mask that you've created will be listed in the list. So you can simply choose the mask you're looking for, and off you go. One thing worth pointing out is that there is ability to show an unmasked dialog, where with the unmasked dialog, it shows the dialogs the way that they were constructed in 2013 R1 in previous versions where there were no graphic images. So if you found that it, with the graphic images and the dialog box improvements that have been added that perhaps some of the items that you're looking for are hard to find, while you're in the process of learning how the new screen layout's been done, you can show the unmasked dialog to get back to the way that things looked in previous versions from a year and back prior. Then one final thing to mention here is that at this version of EdgeCam, CPLs can now be created in manufacture mode. It's quite common that I'm in the middle of doing an index and I need a CPL somewhere and then have to jump back to design mode to create it. To show how that works, first we need to add the command to make CPLs into our menu. That command's on the solids menu. So when I go into here and choose the CPL command and add it into the menu, now that I've customized and added that in, when I go to CPL, I can not only select a CPL, we'll call this side wall. I can specify an origin if I want and the construction method to use. And so I go click this side wall and when I look in from a front view, you'll notice that we can see that angular display of that CPL that we've created. That can be a, a, a quick shortcut to creating CPLs that you may not have anticipated needing right in the middle of manufacture mode prior to an index. 
You could still do the same thing by going back to design mode, but this speeds up the process considerably. Let's wrap up with a look at the software that installs with EdgeCam, the live job reports, automation tools, code wizard, and editor. As we showed in the demonstration, EdgeCam 2014 R1 now includes a new piece of software called Live Job Reports. These are installed with EdgeCam, and this new job report system runs as a website. It's designed to be able to take the information in your job kits and be able to share that information anywhere that you wish. Any computer with access to the URL of the Live Job Report website can open um, the HTML files. That includes computers, tablets, even smartphones. One of the advantages of running this as a website compared to the older database system is that it has very fast performance regardless of the database size. Users that had job kits that numbered in the thousands of jobs could have some amount of time that it took to wade through the data in there, particularly if the website needed to be refreshed. Because this new one runs live, as the name indicates, there's no refresh needed. The data is always up to date. There's also new technology including a new materials report, and tools report, and ability to take job report pages and export them to PDF, Excel, Word, and images so that they can be printed or perhaps accessed through other devices. There's also excellent search and filter capability. So we would definitely suggest that anyone who's been using the older job report system should think about moving into the new live job reports. The two systems can coexist. There's no special migration needed. It's a very easy transition to make and begin doing. Users that haven't begun using any job reports yet might consider this as a useful tool to be able to share data with other users. It's included as part of all EdgeCam licenses, and it doesn't require any additional setup. As mentioned earlier, it installs with EdgeCam, but the EdgeCam DVD image does include an option to install only live job reports. You might want to do that if you're in a multi-user environment and wish to host the live job reports from a computer other than the EdgeCam workstation. We'll be providing a fairly in-depth look at the live job report system and how it works and how you can distribute job reports through it in an upcoming future web printing event. So stay tuned for that. There's also been improvements to the strategy manager. So as shown in the lower right hand screen image, when we're working inside a data node, constraints that have multiple items listed now show as a multi-line dialogue and there's comments available in them. It makes it much easier to see nodes that have been created that span multiple lines and have multiple constraints in them, whether it's a strategy that you created or something that someone else made. Additionally, previous versions, the constraints were listed in the order that they were created but we now have up and down arrows that allow us to change the order of events. So I can take one of the um, conditions in a constraint and I can move it up and down in the list at will. So this makes it much easier to arrange data. There's also a great search ability now so we can search through the existing strategy as well as any sub-strategies that that strategy happens to call. And all of these tools help make it easier to both maintain existing strategies that, that you may have created and also to investigate and further maintain and improve strategies that someone else has created, like possibly the strategies that install and ship with EdgeCam. Masks have been improved as well. Masks were introduced at EdgeCam 2013 R2 and in order to use masks, an XML file was created. We now have a mask editor available at EdgeCam 2014 R1 that simplifies masks tremendously. The only requirement is the advanced JavaScript license. It is a zero cost item, but it is an item, a license item that you have to purchase. If that's something that you're interested in, please contact M2 Technologies and we can provide that for you. Now the concept behind masks is to address the user request that many, many users have to control the data fields that they see when they create a cycle. 
Masks allow us to instruct EdgeCam which input fields we want the user to be able to see and what the default value of any input field we wish to control should be. This also allows users to create essentially their own specialty cycles. So we can take flexible cycles like profiling or finish turning or rough turning and essentially create our own custom cycles where we set the values that we want to have as registered defaults we remove input fields we don't want the user getting into, all very easily done. So to access the masks, each cycle dialog has a little button up to the side of the X in the upper right corner of the dialog. And when you click on that, you can not only select existing masks that may have been created, the screen image here shows that the roughing cycle already comes with the high-speed roughing and the standard mask. You can not only select existing masks, but you can also choose Customize Dialog. And when you choose this, this opens up the new mask editor in EdgeCam 2014 R1. Masks are a, a really simple to use tool for customizing the software and, and setting up the input fields the way you wish. We encourage you to get started and check it out if you wish. We'll also be providing some in-depth training as a web training offering, so stay tuned for that. Just a quick reminder that there's a variety of new things added to Code Wizard, as there uh, usually is at each release. In this case here, the Code Wizard has some editing enhancements that really help with working in code constructors. Those of you familiar with text editors probably know that the Control and the A keys select everything in the text editor, and that now works in code constructors. There are some additional ones too, but to check those out, if you simply open up Code Wizard, Go to the Help menu and choose the uh, Code Wizard Help. The top, top, the top topic in the Code Wizard section, as shown in the screen image, lists all the new things in Code Wizard. This is a standard thing that happens at each release, and you'll definitely want to check that out. In addition to the um, editing improvements, you have things like the dynamic offsetting, the 3D cutter compensation, um, and other things on the milling including the ability to cancel cutter comp on tool retractions. On the turning side, there's the coolant expansion to line up with milling and also support for a third and a fourth tool setting position for keyed turrets. Uh, keyed turrets were added at EdgeCam 2013 R2 and they're further expanded uh, here at 2014 R1. As we noted, the editor has a fresh user interface with a ribbon toolbar. Many of the functions you're used to are easier to get to and work from. There's been also some minor software improvements that hopefully make the editor just much quicker and more productive for you. So if you have additional questions on EdgeCam, we encourage you to consider submitting it through our tech support desk. We also have information up on our, our website in a series of blog tips that you may find helpful. Don't forget the Vero Customer Portal, and through the portal you can go over to the Customer Community Forums, where there's a great deal of information on EdgeCam, including forums dedicated to the 2014 R1 version, which includes not only information from M2 Technologies, but information from other resellers, from Vero, and questions and answers from other customers. It's a really helpful tool that expands uh, your knowledge of the software. If you haven't installed EdgeCam 2014 R1 yet, you might want to note the uh, link to our tech tip on the installation and first launch where we go through what you'll expect during that process so that you can begin it very comfortably and have um, a real fast transition into the new version. If you haven't downloaded the, the software yet, you can download it from the Vero customer portal under the support and uh, software downloads page. We've provided a link to where you can find that and we encourage you to get started with the latest version as soon as you can.